a visibly uncomfortable Marco Rubio, Republican senator from Florida and perpetual coward and loser, was interviewed by Jonathan Carl of ABC. And what followed was one of the most excruciating interactions I've ever seen between a Republican politician and the press in which Rubio further disgraced himself in front of the American people, something I didn't think would be possible. But before we unpack all that, if you end up liking this video and you want to support the channel, please be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and alert bell before you go. I'd greatly appreciate it. All right, friends, I'm warning you right now, if you struggle with secondhand embarrassment, if seeing people just disintegrate before you makes you uncomfortable, this is going to be tough to watch. Marco Rubio, believe it or not, used to be a prominent name in the Republican Party and in America. I mean, he, my God, he was one of um, the leading candidates for the presidency in 2016, at least on the Republican side. And since then, he's basically because he lost all his vertebrae when you know, Donald Trump assumed the presidency and basically removed Marco Rubio's spine. Uh, Marco Rubio basically faded into the background as more deranged uh, and bold Republicans stepped up to replace him. But every now and then Rubio comes out of the woodwork. And apparently there are rumors that Donald Trump may select Rubio to be his running mate for this year's election. So I assume that's why they're parading him out now. Before I get to, again, these awkward, uncomfortable clips, I want to remind you in a bit of a palate cleanser of what Marco Rubio and Donald Trump used to say about each other publicly. This is important. I will address, uh, you know, little Rubio. Little Marco. Little Marco. You know Marco. Little Marco. He's always calling me little Marco. He's a little. L-I-D-D-L-E. -D -D -L little. Little. Little Marco. Donald is not going to make America great. He's going to make America orange. He was putting on makeup with a trowel. I like to... A guy with the worst spray tan in America is attacking me for putting on makeup. I never saw a human being sweat like this guy. He doesn't sweat because his pores are clogged from the spray tan that he uses. I will not say that he was trying to cover up his ears. Then he asked for a full-length mirror, maybe to make sure his pants weren't wet. I don't know. Little mouth on him. Bing, bing, bing. Bing, 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 bing. We have a con artist as the front runner in the Republican Party. Listen to this light little nothing. Say Trump's a con man. I mean, this guy bankrupted a casino. How do you bankrupt a casino? Move. The problem with Marco, he's a choke artist. He chokes. Have you seen his hands? They're like this. He hit my hands. Nobody has ever hit my hands. Look at those hands. Are they small hands? And, and you, you know, know what, what they, they say, say about men with small, small hands? hands? I guarantee you there's no problem. I guarantee you. Well, I don't know anything about bankrupting four Art. companies. No, you I, bankrupt I, I four As you can tell, there was a time when these two not only didn't get along, they seemingly despised each other and took every opportunity, not just to disagree on policy. Donald Trump obviously knows nothing about policy but to make vicious personal attacks at each other. Well, now Marco Rubio, if you've ever watched Game of Thrones, is effectively reek. He is a shadow of his former self, nowhere near as defined. You can even see it in his posture. He's hunched forward. He can't possibly bring himself to publicly defy the cult leader, Donald Trump. And that will be made abundantly clear in the clips I'm about to show you. And I want you to remember one of the segments or one of the little bits in the clip that I just played, the montage in which he refers to Trump as a con artist. Keep that in the back of your mind. But yeah, we're going to play some of these clips and we're going to unpack them together. I, I want to turn to politics. There was some reporting this week that you are possibly under consideration to be Donald Trump's running mate. I, I don't put a lot of stock in this reporting right now or we're, we're early, uh, but you said it would be an honor to be offered a spot on his ticket. Really? Yeah, I think anyone who's offered the opportunity to serve this country as vice president should be honored by the opportunity to do it if you're in public service. I'm in the Senate because I want to serve the country. Being vice president is an important way to serve the country. But I've also been clear, I've never talked to Donald Trump. I've never talked to anybody on his team or family or inner circle about vice president. That's a decision he's going to make. He has plenty of really good but, people to pick from. I mean, the reason why I ask is, I mean, look what happened to the last guy. Uh, I mean, the, a, a mob stormed the Capitol literally calling to hang Mike Pence. Listen, and Trump defended those chants of hang Mike Pence. I will tell you this, that when Donald Trump was president of the United States, this country was safer, it was more prosperous. We had, we had relations, for example, in a part of the world that I care about called the Western Hemisphere that, that, that were very strong. We had a lot of good things done there. I think the country and the world was a better place when he was president. Okay, so a couple of things. Even granting, let's assume that that's the case. We have no reason to grant that that's the case. As a matter of fact, we have plenty of reason to believe otherwise, given that Donald Trump was president in 2020 during the COVID pandemic in which the economy cratered 
and hundreds of thousands of Americans died, ultimately a million in large part because of Donald Trump's mismanagement of the pandemic. Just setting all that aside, you also have to prove that for whatever prosperity you saw in this country and in the world, Donald Trump was responsible for it. Again, Republicans do this all the time. Not only do they shave 2020 off of Donald Trump's four-year term, they just basically give him three years and hope that we forget about the fourth year. They also say, hey, because this thing occurred while Trump was president, Trump was responsible for it. He gets the credit. Unless it's a bad thing that happened while Donald Trump was president and then that doesn't count, he shouldn't get the blame for it. They do this awkward gerrymandering that we should endlessly mock and point out. But the other thing is, the point that Jonathan Carl made about Donald Trump's previous vice president is something worth addressing, given that not only did Donald Trump rile up a mob with murderous intentions, by the way, towards then Vice President Mike Pence, as we've discussed, Mike Pence over the past week or so has publicly declared that he will refuse to endorse Donald Trump for a second term. So maybe Marco Rubio should keep that in mind that a fellow Republican, Donald Trump's former vice president, a man who presumably knows Trump and has worked with Trump much more closely than even Rubio, uh, won't endorse him for a second term. So maybe that undermines Rubio's entire endorsement of Trump. Now, with that in mind, I want to play this next clip, which is a continuation of the first in which Marco Rubio um, then does the inverse of everything that he just did with Trump. And he displays full on chronic, perhaps. I don't know, just really bad Biden derangement syndrome, Biden derangement syndrome. You'll kind of be shocked at how far he takes this. Who's there now, Joe Biden, who's been a disaster economically. Look, look at the world. Every single day we wake to a new crisis, to a new conflict. Everything has gone on fire since the time Joe Biden took over. Afghanistan's gone down. Ukraine has been invaded. Now the Philippines and the Chinese are on the verge of something bad happening every single day, not to mention the threats to Taiwan. We have, we have this blow up in Haiti going on in our very own hemisphere. We wake up every single day, terrorist attacks. But, but, Nine but million people but, across the border. I mean, I mean, that's you're, what matters you're not suggesting me. that's all happening because of of Biden. Absolutely, I but, am. But, well, let, 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 Absolutely, I'm suggesting it happening because of Biden. He's president and his weakness and his... It's just because of Biden that, that, that Russia invaded Ukraine? Absolutely. It's because of Biden that, that, that Haiti... Okay, let, 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 Absolutely. Could, I mean, could, Putin is sitting there saying these guys can't even stand up to the Taliban and they have to fly people hanging off the wings of these airplanes. Now's the time to go. It, it, and, I, mean, by the way, I mean, Trump's the one saying that, that suggesting that, that there should be a deal that give, effectively gives uh, Putin what he wants in Ukraine. But let, let, can we take well, a that's quick- that's not true. He, what he has said is he wants the conflict to end, which is striking to me that people, why wouldn't people want peace? Can, what I've said is there is going to be a negotiated, so Russia's not going to take all of Ukraine. Can, can, can we and Ukraine's a- not going to push Russia back to the where it was in 2014. I want Ukraine to have the upper hand in any negotiation. Can, can, can- but Donald Trump has made it abundantly clear while he was in office when he attempted to extort Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky in order to dig up dirt on Joe Biden, his then domestic political rival, which is insanely corrupt. And Rubio would be shouting from the rooftops if a Democrat ever attempted to do that to a Republican. But of course, because Democrats are morally and ethically superior to elected Republicans, something like that's not going to happen. But I digress. You see the sleight of hand there. Jonathan Carl points out, well, well, listen, if you're talking about, you know, appeasing Putin, Trump has publicly said that he does want to appease Putin. He's publicly appeased and praised Putin in the past. So why should we believe that Putin would behave differently if Trump was in power for uh, a second term? Why would we believe that? And again, note the Biden derangement syndrome. He literally blames everything bad in the world on Joe Biden. Jonathan Carl couldn't even believe it. He was just like, wait, wait a minute. Surely you don't believe that all of the world's problems are Joe Biden's fault. And Marco Rubio with a straight face. Yeah, of course it is. It's all Joe Biden's fault. That is Biden derangement syndrome. That is more of a derangement syndrome than anything we've heard from critics of Trump about Trump. Trump derangement syndrome is nothing in comparison to Joe Biden is literally responsible for all the problems in the world. Super weird stuff. But if you think that was uncomfortable, watching him stammer through these answers, you need to watch this. And now we're coming full circle because Jonathan Carl hits Marco Rubio with Marco Rubio. Down memory lane while we're talking about this. This was you in 2016. What we are dealing with here, my friends, is a con artist. He is a con artist. First of all, he runs on this idea that he is fighting for the little guy. But he has spent his entire career sticking it to the little guy. You all have friends that are thinking about voting for Donald Trump. Friends, do not let friends vote for con artists. 
Friends do not let friends vote That's for Connors. You know I could have gone on. I could have played yeah, more. Yeah, but so, so but, why didn't you play the clip of Kamala Harris but, basically insinuating that Joe Biden was a segregationist well, 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 on the debate we, stage we, and we, she's we, now we, his vice president? We play that. But, but, but let me ask you. Well, you didn't play it now. That was then. Well, yeah, I mean, that was well, then. Well, but it was well, a campaign. Okay, okay but, but let me ask you right now, where we are right now. Donald Trump is, is making the case, and he's going to do it before the Supreme Court, that the president of the United States should have absolute immunity, should effectively be above the law for virtually anything that a president does while in office. You don't agree with that. Well, I don't. So I don't think that well, on the case of immunity, there's two separate issues here. One is, can the president do anything? Can he go out and basically, you know, kill one of the members of his staff overnight inside the White House? Obviously, that's an absurd outcome, and that's a common crime. But I do think there's a legitimate issue here that we need to talk about writ large, especially after what we've seen the last three years is, do we want to live in a country where basically the opponents of a president can, can, can extort them, can have leverage over them during their entire presidency and say, don't worry, once you're out of office, we're going to prosecute you. We're going to come after you. We're going to charge you for this crime. Yeah, but he's saying, you for that absolute, crime. He's, he's saying absolute immunity. He's well, saying, I mean, we'll see. I mean, we'll, okay. uh, you know, this goes before the Supreme Court. Yeah, yeah, there's going to be oral arguments. Saying, we'll as, with, as a guy that's yeah, supposed his, to run he's, for president. He, he's not representing himself at the Supreme Court. Lawyers will make that argument. Um, but we're living in a country now where basically if you're president, now you have to think to yourself, I got to be careful what I do as president, not even legal or illegal, even on policy, because if I upset the wrong people, well, as you soon as I leave, be careful not to break gonna, the laws. President. Well, but 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 you look at these prosecutions that are coming about. You've got this lady, clear partisan in New York, yeah. who's basically prosecuting the president over loans, uh, uh, something that's never been done to anybody before. The banks, well, who are supposedly the victims work. of what they claim, are all saying we don't even rely on what the president's statements are. We do our yeah. own internal investigation to see if the properties are worth what they're worth. Okay, and you've got a judgment on them. That's just so. That was really awkward. That was really awkward. For Marco Rubio to try to run defense and carry water for Trump's assertions that he is entitled to absolute legal immunity. I mean, just super awkward. Donald Trump makes no exception for these things. And now Rubio says, well, his lawyers will argue something different. OK, sure. But Trump, the actual presidential candidate, says and seems to believe that he should be above the law. It doesn't matter what Trump's attorneys argue. They have a more sophisticated understanding of the law, and they could probably couch it in better legalese than Trump can. But isn't it really weird and uncomfortable and dangerous that the guy you're pledging allegiance to, who you used to publicly mock, seems to have that sense of entitlement? Marco, if Barack Obama or Joe Biden were running around saying that they should be entitled to absolute immunity, what would you as a Republican say? You wouldn't appeal to their attorneys. You would, of course, decry that language as well you should. Because that sort of language and rhetoric and sentiment is dangerous no matter who it's coming from, a Democratic presidential candidate or a Republican presidential candidate. But as is often the case, the bad stuff uniquely comes from the Republican. And if you had any sort of integrity and spine whatsoever, you would call it out and say, no, Donald, you are not entitled, nor should you be, nor should anybody be entitled to absolute legal immunity. But listen, Marco Rubio, a member of the Party of Law and Order and Personal Accountability, is making excuses and he seems to be very upset, clutching his pearls, that Donald Trump seems to be facing law and order and personal accountability, or at least legal accountability, since he himself won't take any. But just watching him bend over backwards, especially when, you know, Jonathan Carl plays that clip. And then this idea that why didn't you play stuff that Kamala Harris ever said about Joe Biden? Well, number one, you're not Kamala Harris. Why the hell would Jonathan Carl play a clip about Kamala Harris or of Kamala Harris? When you're not Kamala Harris and the question has nothing to do with Kamala Harris, he it just so weird and cringe and ridiculous. And by the way, Vice President Harris said nothing to the extent or frequency against President Biden than Joe Biden uh, that Marco Rubio said about Donald Trump, like against apples and oranges. Is it true that uh, primary candidates tend to take shots at each other? Yes. But Rubio, Trump, Cruz and Trump, uh, Lindsey Graham and Trump, they went infinitely harder in the paint. And it was infinitely more personal and consistent. That why, that's why the 180 that they've done is so jarring because it's unusual compared to standard primary politics. Marco Rubio say, ah, it's just it's a typical primary. No, it's not. We've never seen anything like that in a Republican primary or a Democratic primary, no matter how much he wants to pretend otherwise. The fact of the matter is Marco Rubio should slither back into the shadows because he has no charisma. He has no credibility. Nobody takes him seriously anymore. And again, visibly uncomfortable and pain the whole time stammering through these answers. He knows that um, he's debasing himself, and yet he does it anyway. And that is the dangerous power of Donald Trump. 
and the threat that this cult poses to the rest of the country. Let me know what you think in the comments.